So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Anjir Stogi. Um, I am uh, a nephrologist and also the director of the core kidney program. And I want to welcome everybody to our program today. We have actually quite a bit of attendees. We also got a lot of questions as well. And we'll try to answer as many as we can. But we also have a very eclectic and uh, group of people today participating. We, we have a wonderful dietitian, um, a psychologist, and, and, and a person who's will be co-hosting the event with me, one of our Circle of Core, Mark Coronel. And also I wanna thank our Circle of Core, Christina Lopez uh, for organizing this and our Brewing Beans who are helping at the back end as well. So with that, uh, and Green Ribbon stands for kidney disease. So don't forget that the Green Ribbon campaign was started at UCLA. Just a disclaimer, anything that's discussed today is for your information only. Please don't make any changes in your care uh, till you speak to your healthcare provider. I think that's, that's actually very, very important. And this is our contact information. That's a direct uh, back line, actually, 310-954-2692. If you have any questions, comments, please send us to corekidney at mednet.ucla.edu. This is our, our email address. This comes to me and, and, and Christina and, and my staff and our website. Um, is, is listed over here. And also please do follow us on Facebook as well and, and say comments and like. I think it's good to get this information out uh, in the general public. This is our website. Um, this is where our previous uh, event, Living Kidney Donation, we'll be talking a lot more about this in our future events. And this is our, our uh, kidney health conference that we did uh, a few months ago. And there's plenty of very useful information on this website, including information about COVID-19, about diet, which, which Rebecca will be going over in a bit more detail as well. Our future event is very simple. It's gonna be first of every month at the same time, it's 5 p.m. PST. So it's one hour, five to 6 p.m. every single month. So you don't have to, first of every month, you don't have to, have to uh, and, and the same link that you have can be used for future events as well. This is our mission statement. And, and, and uh, Christina is, is our manager. Um, our, our goal actually is to make all the patients their, their own best advocates. And how do they become their own best advocates? By, by becoming more knowledgeable about their disease state. And, and these programs are geared towards that, increasing the information, the knowledge, our patients and their, their, their loved ones and family member, members can have. Now the Green Ribbon Campaign uh, was started at UCLA by our Circle of Core and it's about increasing kidney disease awareness. And why do you have to increase kidney disease awareness? Because kidney disease is silent. It's, it's most of the patients don't find out that they have kidney disease till it's fairly advanced. And early diagnosis is critical. There's at every stage, there is you know, a plan, but the earlier it's diagnosed, the better it is. So, so interventions can actually bring in good results. This is our circle of core. This is um, a, a volunteer group, which, which is about patient advocacy and support. They, they have kidney disease, they have had kidney disease, they've been on dialysis, they've been transplanted, they have, they're kidney donors. So if you want to reach out to an advocate or a support person, please let us know. And, and we will connect you with the right person. Today, uh, Mark Coronel, who's a co-host and will be the co-host for all our events moving forward, um, will be uh, discussing his, his experience as well. And he is, is an amazing, inspiring person. So, so please reach out to him as well if you have any questions. And there he is. So Mark, uh, with this, I'll, I'll hand over to you and I, and, and, and please take it over from here. Hey, Doc, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you uh, for everyone who's attending today. Just a little bit of a story on my background. Um, I was diagnosed at 26. I'm 36 now. I've had kidney disease for, um, for 10 years now. I've been through the stages of being diagnosed, was on dialysis, and then ended up on a kidney transplant. What's interesting about today is we're going to be going over diet. And that played a really key factor in the role that I had to make sure that my levels were okay based on my diet. When I was diagnosed, it was low, it was low protein. When I was on a kidney transplant, 
it was high protein. So, I mean, it all, it all, it was all very different for, for the stages. And, and I'm glad we have Rebecca today as the dietitian. But um, as my story goes, um, I needed to find out, you know, uh, with the full process, you know, we go through this mental struggle, this, well, what can I eat now? Or what can I drink now? And, and the battle of kidney disease really, really affected my life, which, which, which also played with the mental health portion, which I'm excited to announce that we will be having a wellness, wellness uh, program on the CORE website. So um, I, I had a transplant December 10th, 2019. Um, I was on dialysis for a year and a half. And I needed to learn what, what my diet really was. I, would, I was on Foster Spiners. I was taking three a day after every meal. Um, I, I needed to figure out because every stage of your kidney disease is completely different, right? And I know, Doc, you know, when you deal with patients, you, you, you deal with them on a case-by-case basis, right? Um, how, how, how is that for you? You know, because, you know, having, having to always ask you questions, um, it was really hard for me to, to, to deal with that diet. Right. So, so uh, Mark, I think you, you bring up a very good qu- uh, point. And it's not a question, it's actually a comment, is um, about, you know, the question that we get asked. And, and I want to uh, get back to the kidneys. This is the two kidneys that are in, in the back. And uh, the transplanted kidney goes over here. It's actually in the front. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll be going over this in our future events as well about the transplant. Today's our focus is going to be more on, on, on fruits and, and healthy living and eating. Um, this is how kidney disease is defined. It's a chronic disease. So you, if you have any evidence of kidney damage for three months or more, um, you are you, you are said to have chronic kidney disease. And, and one of the things that all of the attendees I want today is to know what their GFR is. So if you don't know your GFR, which stands for glomerular filtration rate, it's the kidneys act as a filter, and this is your filtration rate. Um, and if your filtration less, is less than 60, then by itself, uh, it will qualify or, or classify you as having chronic kidney disease. Now, diabetes, uh, these are some of the common causes. Hypertension, we just have to be a bit careful about how we look at hypertension as a cause because it's a chicken or the egg. Most of the kidney patients will have high blood pressure. And by the time they're diagnosed with kidney disease, they already have high blood pressure. And one one of of the things that I'm gonna ask our audience today, and we have quite a bit, and and I know we have Ms. Bonebreak uh, joined from Alport Foundation as well. Alport is one of the, um, syndrome is one of the common causes of kidney disease, um, common inherited cause of kidney disease. And I know there's a lot of our ADP, KD patients as well. But if you don't have a known diagnosis of kidney disease and, and, and your diagnosis as, is listed as high blood pressure, please reach out to, to me and the core kidney program because we might test you for, for genetic testing for kidney disease. Um, uh, the future is genetics, whether, whether it be in diagnostic or therapeutic. And, and you know, we have the 23andMe and all these things, but, but there are broad panel testing for kidney disease when they test over 400 genes just for, for kidney diseases. And, and if you don't have a known diagnosis or if we have a known diagnosis that doesn't make any sense, please reach out to us and we will, uh, we will facilitate your, your genetic testing. And once again, the email address as it's being put in over here is corekidney at mednet.ucla.edu. Now, these are the five stages of chronic kidney disease. The earliest is stage one, the most advanced is stage five. And as you can see, this is largely based on your GFR. So make sure that you you know your GFR. And this GFR comes from creatinine. So this is a derived uh, number and it's being derived among other things by a simple blood test called creatinine. And patients with advanced kidney disease, kidney failure, can either go to transplant or dialysis. Now, um, I think they, there was a question which I want to answer right now. Um, it's come, coming from Ms. Uh, Abraham. I'm a family practice PA. I want to know, is there a specific indication for peritoneal dialysis? Also the advantage and disadvantages compared to hemodialysis. Now, um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Abram, I'll answer this um, 
as briefly as I can because we're going to have another uh, session on this. But when you go to kidney disease, advanced kidney disease, you have different options and you should know your options. Uh, number one should always be transplant, but because of the waiting time, it's, it's not something that you can immediately get. So the second best option is dialysis. And if you're on dialysis or getting close to dialysis and you're not on home, not dialyzing at home, you need to ask your nephrologist and care team, why are you not on home dialysis? And they better have a good reason for that because home dialysis is by far the best modality to be if you're on dialysis. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We will. What are some of the advantages of home dialysis? Number one, you do it at home. Um, and peritoneal dialysis is a kind of home dialysis. You do it at home, you have a lot of flexibility and also for peritoneal dialysis, you don't use your veins. You actually go through your peritoneal cavity in a kidney patient. And this is the other, any stage of kidney disease, preserve your veins. You know, you should be focusing on making sure that, that your veins are not accessed unless it's absolutely necessary because that is your lifeline. And there are some cases in which patients on dialysis run out of access. They don't have veins that you can, can. so it's very, very important in PD, you actually uh, preserve the veins. The other important thing is it's more gentler. You do dialysis, um, you know, your kidneys work 24 seven, 144 hours in a week. And if you go to in-center uh, hemodialysis, you're getting dialysis 14 or 12 hours a week. Now you can see the disconnect between 12 hours and 144. And there are a lot of other benefits, Ms. Abraham, I'll be very happy to, to answer them. But, but for everybody who's on the call today or know people who are have kidney disease, if they do get to the, my job is to prevent patients from getting on with, with, on, 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 you know, with on dialysis or transplant. And, 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 but if you do get on dialysis or get to the stage, transplant is probably the best option. And that's where Mark comes in. But keep in mind, your kidneys are your kidneys. You, you want to preserve, and if, if any of my patients ask about transplant dialysis in stage three, I won't even address it. And the reason for that is my job is to preserve their kidney function as much as we can and as long as we can. So, so um, these are the five stages. Please know your stages. And this is where the kidney care comes in. Pre-diagnosis, diagnosing even before you have kidney disease. So if you have the risk factors for kidney disease, diabetes or anything else, then start getting checked in advance. And then for every stage you actually have, and then as you can see, dietary education is front and center. Uh, it's very important that you be on the right diet and monitor that closely. Now, Mark, uh, these are your labs, right? Um, you know, I've done all these things, how to read a label, but you should also know, everybody should know how to read a lab. So Mark, tell me more about these labs that were drawn, I think a while ago. Um, actually, Doc, these are my most recent labs. Okay. Um, and yeah, these are my most recent labs that, that was just done maybe two weeks, uh, a month and a month ago, I believe. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think Mark, th these are way back when, when um, you had that salmonella infection, remember? Creating a 1.5 that you were telling us that story. Right. Yeah, so this, these right, are not right. the most recent labs. As they, these are way back, oh, but they look very similar. Right, they look similar. So it's very interesting, Doc, because I, I, I had a 1.49 and not, being, not knowing any information about kidney disease or dialysis. Um, this was when, when I was in the ER because I had salmonella. And they said, your, your creatinine level might be high because you're very dehydrated. And they sent me home. So... My assumption was that all I have to do is drink water, maybe some Gatorade, and maybe come back another year from that point and, and figure where my levels are at now, you know? But yeah, I, I wish I caught this, uh, this creatinine in my, my GFR much sooner and had the educational understanding of what I was going through. Because um, mm -hmm. 10 years later, you know, I ended up on, you know, dialysis and now post kidney transplant. But yeah. I think. And this is and this is and this is uh, looking back. If I had the proper dietary guidance, because I was I was still young, I wanted to eat uh, you know junk food and, and all these other these these comforting foods that I could have 
possibly, you know, save my kidneys if I didn't do that. Yeah, right. So, so, so Mark, um, so let's, let's go over these labs really quick. So uh, th this is your blood work, right? This is, so the big tests are blood and urine. This is, and today we focus on your blood test. And as you can go, sodium okay. right at the top um, is I think being cut off and they, they'll give you the normal range, uh, 135 to 145. So always know your normal range and where you fit in. And as you can see, Mark's at that time when he went, and this is before he was diagnosed with, with uh, kidney disease. Um, so his sodium was fine. His potassium 3.5 to 5.1 was fine. Total CO2, we'll be going over this in a bit more detail. This is another way to say bicarbonate. Um, an example is baking soda. So bicarbonate um, levels in your blood and it should be above 22. So whenever you look, going over your labs, your bicarbonate level should be above 22. And, and, and one of the things we'll be discussing this but let's look at, at, at creatinine. The normal range is one point, you know, anything below 1.1. When Mark went uh, to the ER, his creatinine was high at 1.49 and his GFR, which is here listed as non-African-American was 60. So his GFR was already low, but he went to the ER and they said, uh, look, Mark, um, you have this diarrhea, you have some stuff, you're probably dehydrated and you'll be fine. Now, having said that, that's all okay. You know, he might have been dehydrated. He might have been having gastrointestinal symptoms. But what was the follow-up, right, Mark? There was no follow-up after that. Right. Uh, next time you find out, and, and this was one of the hints that needed to be followed up. Um, and, and Mark, like you said, now in hindsight, you know, if you had this knowledge, then you probably would have picked up kidney disease much sooner. So. Somebody is saying you're in the ER, you're in the clinic, you're probably dehydrated. Well, the short answer would be, well, we'll rehydrate you and we'll check it again. And after rehydration, if the creatine does not come down, that means it was not because of dehydration. It's actually a diagnosis of exclusion, right, Mark? Um, Correct. So, um, I, I think this is where you have to be proactive. Um, if somebody's saying, well, the, the ER doctor should have said to you, Mark, well, I think it's dehydration. Of course, nobody can just say it's dehydration. You know, that's not a diagnosis that you do with a blood test. But why didn't you follow up with your primary care physician? Why didn't you follow up with your physician? If you have a nephrologist, after hydration. I, th I think that is important. And these are some of the other calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. All these labs are quite important. And, and everybody from my ask today is that they should go and look at your labs and follow up on that. Any comments, Mark? Um, no, Doc, you're 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 100 right. Um, I I think uh, even at that point, and I just want to re reiterate my story from that point was, I wish I would have followed up. I didn't even know what a nephrologist was. Right? right. We don't know what these specialists are and what they do, because it's not something that we, we know everything about when going into the hospital. We just wanna make sure that we're okay and we can get out and go back to the real world and say, look, that was, that was a thing that I went through, now let's keep moving forward. Yes. So yes, I think now at this point, as an advocate now for myself, I think if you see any form of, of uh, you know, levels that are, that, are, that are actually increasing is, is question that, you know, and, and, and see what type of specialist is that, you know, and, and, yeah. and go with that. Yeah. Yep. Right. Very good, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, there's another of question course. That, that came up and the question is my GFR is in the sixties. Is it okay to take baby aspirin? And, and the answer is yes, it is okay. The, the cardiovascular disease, heart disease coexists with kidney disease and they go hand in hand. So anything to prevent cardiovascular disease or treat it is very important. And baby aspirin, is, is if, if it's indicated in your case, it's completely fine to take that. These are some of the tests, creatinine, and, and, and from creatinine, we calculate EGFR, blood urea nitrogen, urine test, protein in the urine, and then finally imaging test. Um, uh, one question that's coming up is, is herbal medications. Now, let me talk, talk, talk about herbal medications. Um, 
you know, so, so the drugs that you're taking, the FDA approved drugs, whether it be lisinopril, whether it be candisartan, velsartan, whatever drug you're taking, they go through a very rigorous uh, evaluation, phase one, phase two, phase three. And, and then the FDA sometimes says no, because either they're safety concerns or their efficacy concerns, or they're both. Herbal medications don't go through any of that stuff. Um, that's number one. Number two is they, they might have chemical compounds that can be potentially harmful to your kidneys. I, so it's not that, that they, they're not useful. Actually, the dose is also important. The frequency, whenever you get a medication, it specifically lists that take five milligrams once a day, twice a day, with food, without food, and, and empty stomach and stuff like that. Herbal medication, we don't have that. So with, with herbal medications, first of all, they, they, they might not even cause any benefit, but they might actually cause some harm. So my take on that is be very careful about herbal medications and supplements. And if you ask me about an herbal medication, and I get that question all the time, what do we do with this? I, I would say my guess sometimes might be as good as your guess because I don't know what's inside that tablet. I don't know what the content is. I don't even know how to give it. So how can I comment on that? So I stay away from giving any comment on, on herbal medications as, as far as I can. Now, supplements are not herbal medications. Aspirin is not an herbal medication. Those are actually medications that have data to back it up. So I'm not saying that these herbal medications might not be beneficial. I'm saying is they might not be, but they can be potentially harmful. And I think that's something important point to keep always when you take these medications. So with that, uh, it, it's, it's my real honor to introduce our next speaker and participant. It's uh, Rebecca Goodrich. Rebecca has, is, is a renal dietitian and you can see her qualifications at the bottom. And I, and, and I met Rebecca, I think what was about a year, year and a half ago when you were doing a rotation through my dialysis unit. But Rebecca is not just a dialysis dietitian. She actually covers the entire spectrum. And, and, and she and I have had multiple um, conversations and, um, and you know, she is gonna be a, a participant in our future, um, you know, these um, chats uh, every month. So if you have any questions about a diet, about, um, um, you know, uh, about your health that might be linked directly or indirectly to, to what you're eating, please email us and we will convey it to Ms. Goodrich. Also, uh, she has her own private consultations. So if you want to set up a consultation with her, email us and we will forward that, that uh, information to, to Ms. Goodrich. So with that, Ms. Goodrich, um, uh, today's topic is fruit and you. Thank you, Dr. Rostogi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Rebecca Goodrich. And again, I'm a registered dietitian. Um, Okay, so we are talking about fruit and, and you, right? So when we talk about nutrition and chronic kidney disease or kidney disease in general, um, it's very common to have a lot of questions as far as what do I eat? How much of this can I have in a day? Am I allowed to consume this? What foods can I include in my diet? Can I ever eat that again? What foods should I be avoiding, right? It's just a bunch of questions that you just, you know, you know that the diet is so important, but there's so much confusion around it, kind of like this highway, right? In this, in this photo, there's multiple highways, different avenues. Did we take the right exit? So it could be really confusing, confusing. And I just want to let you know that you are so not alone if you have that confusion, because I hear it all the time. And so I, I hope that I'm able to clarify um, some of these areas for you. Yes. So, so uh, Rebecca, just just, yeah. just uh, one quick quick question from me. So, yeah. so and and I know you, you'll be going uh, over this. There are a lot of questions coming in um, okay. uh, because you 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 you'll be very popular to say the least. Yeah. Uh, some of the questions we can answer today, some we can't because we have limited time till six o'clock. Um, I think one of the question was how to improve kidney function, right? And so let me let me give my answer to that. You're born with your kidney function. You can't improve it. And with age, there's a decline. The question is how fast does it decline? And that you have control over. And how do you slow down the decline? It's about eating healthy, which Rebecca will be going over. It's about Jim Cunningham 
about mental health. You know, we don't talk about mental health or not as much as, as we can. You know, the class example is about what happen, happening right now in the Olympic games. These are athletes that, that sometimes cannot deal with the stress. So these, the seasoned athletes cannot deal with it. How can we talk about human beings? So make sure that you, you address the mental, you know, your, your mindfulness, you know, the, the, the uh, mental health or, or peace, whatever you want and get help if needed from professionals who are experts in this. Just like when you um, have dietary questions, you go to Rebecca, but when you have issues with, with anxiety, with, with, with depression, with, with not knowing anything, then go to, to experts like Jim Cunningham who will be on, on our, and then exercise. So besides medications, I think it's very important. That's what I think Mark spoke about is the core kidney wellness program, you know, mind, body, and soul. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's what Rebecca, I, I wanted to bring up and I know Jim, Jim is on as well. But um, Rebecca, I think, sorry to in, in, interrupt, but I just wanted to put those two cents in. Yeah, no, and that's that's a really important point because you know everything is very integrated with one another. So your nutrition, your mental health and well-being, having your physician on your side, just having that whole support system is really important when we talk about chronic kidney disease or you know any condition for that matter that changes your lifestyle a little bit. So, you know, when we talk about your GFR and we talk about ways to really slow the progression down, research, ongoing research has shown that medical nutrition therapy can really help slow the progression down. And that's basically what we're aiming for. So one of those really important pieces in slowing the progression down is incorporating very nutritious foods. So for instance, um, and for the sake of this presentation, we're specifically talking about fruit. So when we talk about fruit and chronic kidney disease, there are many reasons why you wanna incorporate fruit into your diet. So one, it definitely adds flavor to your meals, making it a less, less boring, more exciting. So whether it be warming up some red apples and putting some, you know, cinnamon on top of it for dessert, right? Instead of having, you know, uh, a sweet uh, ice cream that's filled with lots of sugar that we know is maybe not the greatest, right? Um, and you can still have those things, but in smaller quantities. And of course, that's very individualized. But for the sake of fruits, there's still ways where you can incorporate them where it can be very tasty and can also mimic a dessert. Another great thing about uh, fruit is that it increases fiber, especially when you consume the skins. And why is that? Well, for one, fiber actually binds to cholesterol and therefore it lowers your cholesterol levels and therefore um, it can help prevent cardiovascular disease. And not only that, but we know it's really great for bowel movement, right? For colon health, good colon health. So as we age, we tend to get at a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer, which, you know, make sure you guys are getting your colonoscopy when needed. But, um, you know, fiber in itself is, is just so beneficial for multiple areas of the body. Um, but, you know, it does, it does help increase fiber. And great sources of vitamins and antioxidants, which we will get into as well. But vitamins, oh, wait. Oh, we got to go back just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so when we talk about vitamins, vitamins is an essential nutrient, meaning that we need to get it from our, our diets. Our bodies can't make vitamins on their own. And so fruits and vegetables really provide you with those essential nutrients and antioxidants are anti-inflammatory properties, which again, we'll get into. Um, and, you know, fruits, they, they really provide a healthy snack for us. And so just please note that these are general guidelines and everybody's really different. And I want to emphasize that every body is different. So, you know, no one's the same, no one's going to get the same exact recommendation. So, you know, if you, if you want to consume, you know, a, a fruit as a snack, you can pair it with a healthy protein source. And so if you have a history of diabetes, that would be very helpful because it'll help stabilize your sugar levels, right. To avoid those spikes. Um, and it decreases your risk of developing heart disease, as mentioned previously, um, higher risk from diabetes just because of that ongoing nerve damage. So it is helpful in that respect. Um, go to the next slide. Yeah. And so maybe one of your questions may be, you know, I heard potassium is not good for me. So let me just restrict and limit all potassium foods. And 
I just want to let you guys know that remember, you know, everyone is different. And so when you look up online, you want to be very cautious because, you know, maybe you don't need to limit or restrict your potassium levels yet because your potassium levels are fine. So there's no reason to do any kind of unnecessary restriction or limitation. So I would definitely recommend you speaking to a dietitian, speaking to your doctor, so you have an understanding of what you should personally be doing. But in the event where you know that your potassium levels tend to run a little bit higher, or if you're on dialysis, or you just know you need to watch your potassium level for whatever reason that may be, here is just a couple of uh, fruits. And I say a couple because there's still a lot of other fruits that you can consume that are low in potassium. But as you can see here, apples, blackberries, cherries, lemons, raspberries, plums, watermelon, peaches, grapes. These are all awesome, delicious fruits that you can consume. They are low in potassium. And I did put a little note here that just so you know, an FYI, that high potassium foods have more than 250 milligrams of potassium per serving. Um, and so all of these fruits listed below are less than that, making it a lower potassium fruit. So, uh, Rebecca, just a sure. couple of things, um, uh, you know, these, and I think you made that comment, and I, I just want to uh, reinforce that, yeah. that uh, just because you have kidney disease does not mean that you should be on a low potassium diet. Mm -hmm. uh, it should go based on your blood levels. And I showed you that those levels from Mark, right? If, you're, if your potassium levels are fine, then I think you can be a bit more liberal in, in, in your potassium in your diet. But the the flip side is your potassium actually might be low, right? Uh, and I think that's also very important. And low potassium can be equally harmful as high potassium. Definitely. So, so just because you have kidney disease does not mean that your you need had to be on a potassium restrictive diet. So, so before you decide on what you're going to eat or restrict, number one, look at your kidney uh, disease, what stage you are in. And also look at your labs. You know, you don't even have to ask for the healthcare provider. If you're a UCLA patient, you have my chart. You should have access to all your labs and look at potassium. And, and if, if, if it's actually low, then you should go on a high potassium diet. Um, so I think that's, that's actually a very, very important point to keep in mind. Uh, just a couple of more comments that are coming in. I want to once again thank uh, Ms. Lisa Bonebreak uh, from the Elport Foundation, number one for attending. Uh, she's a she's she's an amazing advocate, and um, and if you do have Alport syndrome or if your family have Alport syndrome, please make sure to reach out uh, reach out to uh, Lisa Bonebreak and the Alport Foundation. They provide immense support to all our patients. Um, okay, Mark. Doc, I wanted to ask one question. Sure. Um, now, a uh, post kidney transplant. Are kidney patients prone to high potassium? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Mark. Um, once you get a kidney transplant, um, your, your kidneys are, are quote unquote working. Um, can you still be hyperkalemic, which is the other word for high potassium in your blood? And the short answer is yes, you can. And the reason for that is number one is, is what is your kidney function? Because some patients, might not have complete recovery of kidney function after transplant. Number two, some patients might have, uh, you know, recurrence of the kidney disease after transplant. So, so they now they are behaving as a CKD. But the other important point is some of the medication that you're put on for transplantation can actually predispose you to high potassium. For example, if you're on a drug, um, and I don't, uh, Mark, are you on program for cyclosporin? But both of those drugs. Can, can increase. These are called the calcineurin inhibitors. So that's number, that's one. So if you're on, and most of the patients are, a good portion of them are on this class of drug that, that limit the, the kidney's capacity to excrete potassium and the potassium levels can, can be high. The other thing is they are also on other medications like, like the, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and they can also increase the potassium levels. Uh, so the key thing, uh, Mark, is to go by your potassium levels. Once again, the importance of looking at, at your, your blood levels. Thank you, Doc. Well, thank you for asking that question. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's a really great question with, with uh, post-transplant and medications that can cause high potassium and something, even, even if you're 
not post-transplant. I've seen, you know, patients that have taken certain ACE inhibitors and that has actually caused the high potassium, not so much of their diet. So that's also something to take note of. Um, so when we talk about chronic kidney disease, you know, again, we were talking about some fruits and fruits that are high in, um, in fiber and also low in potassium. I did want to talk a little bit specifically about blueberries. So I did save the best for last because um, not only was July National Blueberry Month, but blueberries actually are my favorite fruit. And um, they are just so delicious. And, you know, especially living in California, they're just, there's something about the sweetness in, in blueberries. They're just, they're really, they're extra good. Um, so definitely pick up uh, some blueberries when you can. Um, but when we talk about blueberries, again, they are kidney friendly. One cup, which is a pretty generous serving of blueberry, gives you around 114 milligrams of potassium, which is great. The blue color that is in the fruit is what's responsible for the antioxidant property, also known as anthocyanin. And so this anthocyanin is responsible for really decreasing inflammation and specifically oxidative stress. And so you know, if you have a history of diabetes, history of kidney disease, you know, any, any kind of, you know, metabolic syndrome, these types of conditions can actually stir up a little bit of inflammation in the body. And so consuming foods that are really anti-inflammatory, such as blueberries, can really reduce what we call reactive oxygen species, also known as ROS. And so, these guys are responsible for driving up inflammation. And we really want to get that down. And so luckily, you know, nutrition, lifestyle can really assist with all of that. And, you know, not only are blueberries or just fruits in general really great at reducing inflammation, but um, blueberries specifically have been actually shown to play a role in, in decreasing um, the risk of cognitive decline. And the reason for this is, again, because of their antioxidant properties, specifically, again, the anthocyanins and also flavonoids that are responsible for that. Um, and again, it, it is anti-inflammatory. And, you know, there's a lot of ways where you can actually incorporate these blueberries into your diet. And so let's go ahead and look at the next slide. So Rebecca, just yeah. oh, yeah, uh, yeah. One, one, one quick thing uh, about yeah. this, and I think Mark raised her hand as well. Mark, uh, do, do, you, do you have a comment or question? Uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to know, Rebecca, um, is food labeled organic more nutritious? Because I do see that a lot when, when, when we go to the market. Now, is there a difference? Yeah. So when you look at the nutrition profile of conventional versus organic, it's not that one is more nutritious than the other because it's really not that at all. It has to do with what we call herbicides and the way that certain fruits and veg vegetables are treated. So I, this is what I tell my patients. If you can get your hands on some really awesome fruit, do it. Just incorporate fruit and vegetables into your diet. Let's start there. Um, and just so you know, too, you know, certain fruits that have a thick outer layer, a thick skin, you don't need to purchase those organic, you like convention, convention is fine. And, you know, personally, too, I also try to shoot for either fresh or frozen, because I've been asked too, is, fr is fresh better than frozen. And that's actually not the case. And actually, frozen could be a little bit more nutritious because it's flash frozen. So all the nutrients are there intact. And so they're not on a truck, you know, they're not going through all these different ways of transportation where the nutrient profile can decrease. So kind of similar with convention and organic, let's just get our hands on some great, you know, fruits and vegetables and let's just start there. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. This is uh, Jim Cunningham, the, the psychotherapist. Oh, yes, yes. Um, in terms of berries, uh, what I do, what, what's your view on uh, stevia and truvia and some of the various sweeteners that maintain that they're organic, but, um, it, I, or I also put it in Greek yogurt as well. Yeah, so great question. And you're going to see on the next slide, the recipe has to do with Greek yogurt. Um, so stevia and truvia, I actually, def I, I definitely prefer those over sucralose, Splenda, NutraSweet, Equal, because those tend to mimic the way sugar reacts in our body, just plain sugar, these, these artificial sweeteners react the same way as if you are consuming sugar. So Truvia and Stevia, I'm a little bit more, um, I think that, I think that that's a little bit better than consuming the others. 
Um, I know there's also monk fruit and some people like to use other substitutes, but that's, that's fine. I think that that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. What, about, what about Greek yogurt? Just out of, um, out of curiosity. Yeah, so Greek Opiate yogurt. amounts of it. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but. Well, so, so I actually read a study recently saying that uh, Greek yogurt, and we're talking about whole milk too, by the way, but um, Greek yogurt and, and whole milk, so let's say 5% FIA, which is a Greek yogurt, mm. has actually shown to decrease the risk of colorectal cancer. And so Greek yogurt is very nutritious because, you know, it is fermented. There's some, pre, there's some probiotics in there. And, you know, prebiotics and probiotics, well, prebiotics, you know, they, they really provide energy to our colon and, you know, especially short chain fatty acids in the form of butyrate is very, very good for our colons. And, um, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of it. If you're lactose intolerant, there is a smaller amount of lactose in the Greek yogurt. However, some people may be a little bit extra sensitive to it. You can always take a lactase enzyme for that. But I am a huge fan of Greek yogurt. If if you can if you can tolerate it, absolutely. In the event of those who have chronic kidney disease and we have to be a little cautious about the protein intake, that's where it gets individualized. So how can we incorporate that into your diet without going over your protein recommendations? Which we can definitely do that. We can make it fit. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think uh, Rebecca and, and Jim and, and the team did a couple of important points and we'll be discussing this in our future events. The protein intake is important, right? Uh, and, and it depends upon the kidney stage you're in as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be very careful. We'll be having uh, another uh, one of these chats just focusing on protein intake. The other important point is sodium intake. You know, when, when you get these these, these cottage cheeses and, and, and you, you, you know, we, and we'll be going over that as well. So, you know, it has to be a balance um, between, but before we get to the next slide, a couple of comments that I want to make about inflammation cognitive. Yeah. Kidney disease is considered to be a disease of chronic inflammation. So it's a state of chronic inflammation, kidney disease. So that's important to keep in mind as well, especially when you're looking at, at potential anti-inflammatory, anti oxidant foods. The other thing is about cognitive decline. And this is something that just came out recently in a journal on, on, in called neurology, you know, not nephrology, but, but, but in neurology in which they, they found that, that, that these, these uh, fruits can, can actually have a positive impact on, on cognitive decline, dementia, um, and, and by extension, Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. as, as well. So, um, these are good foods to have. The other important point is the quantities are always, you know, if you eat a lot of, of stuff that's low in potassium, that can also uh, lead to a lot of potassium load. And the flip side is true as well. If you eat smallest amounts of food that's high in potassium, you might be okay. But once again, talk to a healthcare provider. It's about a balance between, between all this stuff. And also, um, that's a really good point, Dr. Sogi. The other thing too, is that there are other reasons why that potassium can be high. It could be poor glucose control. It could be medication, yes. yep. you know, so it's not only, you know, cause there have been times where being in, in, you know, working with patients, we've tried to investigate, you know, you're not eating tomatoes, you know, you're not eating mangoes or avocados. So why, why is the potassium high, right? And so that's where the investigation starts. But just so you guys all know that it's not just, you know, diet related, there could be other underlying issues. And that's kind of where we have to figure out the root cause of, of all that. Um, so, you know, this is just an example of a recipe, something that I personally do. It's delicious. You take about a seven ounce, which is those little cups of, of Greek yogurt, 2% plain Greek yogurt. Again, protein needs will vary. So, you know, and as Dr. Rosogi said earlier, there are a total of five different um, kidney stages, chronic kidney disease stages. And so your protein needs will really, um, will depend on, on the stage. Um, so, you know, you just take a plain Greek yogurt and then you add about a half a cup of blueberries, as we saw before, low in potassium. And then personally, I love to add some cinnamon for taste. Um, cinnamon is great for everyone. And also, you know, especially if you have a history of diabetes, cinnamon has been shown to lower blood sugar, which is great. Um, obviously, do not use cinnamon if you have an allergy to it. But that's just kind of a quick um, little way to get some blueberries in. Great. 
And again, thank you guys so much for tuning in and thank you for, you know, listening to this presentation. Um, this is just some information about, you know, about me, it's my website, email, if you have any questions or concerns. And I also do specialize in other conditions such as IBS and IBD, like Crohn's and colitis. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. And yeah, thank you, Dr. Sergi. You'll be a, uh, a constant fixture in, in our future program. So, so Rebecca will be joining us in our, all our future events. And, and today we spoke more about fruits, but we'll be going one by one um, on different aspects of, uh, of healthy eating. Um, also, um, I just want to mention Rebecca's website. It's called radnutrition.health. Um, the best way to contact her would be emailing the core kidney, and we will we'll, uh, channel this to Rebecca. So Rebecca, thank you very much. Uh, you. I, I know there are a lot of questions coming in, but, but yeah, before okay. I forget, one point that I do want to mention is, which I'm not sure if you mentioned, uh, July was uh, Blueberry Month, wasn't it? Yes, yes, July was National Blueberry Month. Yes, so so uh, there you have it. It's you know it was a past month, but but let me go over some questions, uh, and these yeah. might be related to Rebecca. So one is my very dear friend AJ, and I wasn't I'm I'm very pleasantly surprised that she's on. Uh, so AJ um, is saying. Why don't you recommend a plant-based diet? So AJ, it's not that I don't recommend a plant-based diet. I'm a very big proponent of plant-based diet in general. Um, but um, the, the problem becomes is that if you are not a, a, as good as a cook as AJ is, then, then it might sometimes not be as palatable. And I know you're gonna kill me for that, but AJ, I would like you to come to one of our events in the future and talk about plant-based diet along with Rebecca. That would be very, very helpful. AJ is uh, an amazing, amazing um, person, human being, dear friend, um, and, and obviously plant-based diet is, is very big. So mm -hmm. she's gonna be on one of our future shows. Um, one of the questions that we got about PKD, about keto diet and stuff. So that's something else we'll be discussing in the future. Uh, I think we'll try to get also Dr. Weems on one of our conferences um, to, to discuss more specific questions uh, uh, about diet. So that's just stay tuned. Uh, like I said, it's first of every month. Uh, we'll be getting uh, a lot more. Um, uh, but let me go over some questions one by one that, that, that are coming in. Uh, we, we spoke about herbal medications a bit. Um, one of the questions uh, uh, we, you know, one of the questions was about reducing or reversing cyst growth with diet ketosis. So we'll be discussing that in one of our future events. Today is probably, uh, we don't have enough time to do that. We already spoke about aspirin and, and, and GFR. So, so uh, that, that's good. Lisa uh, Bonebreak had her comments in as well. We addressed that. Um, uh, so one of the questions that we got asked is, as you move into the dietary suggestions, it would be wonderful if you can speak to what a person does who has kidney failure and diabetes. So um, Julie, um, I, I think Rebecca spoke about this at some, because of time limitations, we won't be able to speak about everything today, but, but please join us for our future events and, and we will be discussing those uh, in, a, in a lot more. Uh, I want to thank Sumega for her nice comments. Um, we also talked to Lisa once again, Christina put in all the potassium. Um, how often can you eat red meat with stage two PKD or yeah. should you eat uh, at all? So Rebecca, why yeah. don't you answer that? Yeah. So, um, you know, that's a really, that's a really great question. And I, and I, I saw that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a huge, I, I, I'm very passionate about, about the kidneys, about all organs, but I'm also very passionate about the GI system too. And heart health, all of it. Um, it's so amazing how all these organs work synergistically together. But when we talk about red meat, you know, I, you know, as a dietitian who is, you know, I, I am very focused on plant-based foods and that doesn't mean that all foods can't fit because all foods can fit. When we talk about red meat, I really recommend no more than once or twice per week and two times per week is like really pushing it. Um, you know, and I like to really see the nutrition profile. I like to see your labs and kind of see what your lifestyle is like before I even give this general recommendation, but these are just general recommendations, general guidelines. Um, yeah. red meat is very hard on the, on the digestive tract. 
red meat um, has been shown to be actually pro-inflammatory. So it's, I mean, it is a good source of iron, but we can get sources of iron from other areas, but um, that, that would just be my general guideline. Yeah, and, and, and Rebecca, I mean, I, and, and I like the fact that you're middle of the road and so am I, you know, no extremes, but, but, um, but if you can avoid red meat, you should avoid red meat. You should avoid yeah. meat if possible. And that I think will be music to AJ's ears. But, but why is meat potentially bad? And it's bad for a kidney patient for multiple reasons. Number one, it has a higher phosphorus load. Um, you know, the phosphorus that comes from plants versus was animals versus additives, there's a very, very big difference in how much that gets absorbed. So that's number one, it, a high, it has a higher acid load, you know, mm -hmm. in general. So that's not good for your bones. I spoke about total CO2 and bicarbonate, mm -hmm. all the gunk that comes with it. So, and, and the protein, you have to limit yourself, your protein too, um, you know, depending on what stage you're in. So my, my recommendation, and I agree with what Rebecca said, is um, it should be avoided. Now, if you can't live without red meat and that's what, what you need and, and stuff, like Rebecca said, maybe take once a, once a week, I would say once a week, mm -hmm. twice a week and stuff, but, but uh, if you can avoid that, you should avoid that. I mean, there are other stuff you can eat that are beneficial. And, and when AJ comes to our program, she can tell you how to make our, our food very delicious um, mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in plant-based as well. So, so, um, so like Rebecca, I would ag agree with that diet. And, and, and also, you know, uh, what you're pointing out is not just that, it's also about chronic inflammation. It's, a, it's not good for a GI. We spoke about colon cancer. The age for screening has been dropped. It was 50 and now it's 45, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so these are all important things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we are a creature of our habits. You might not do it one week, you might not do it the other week. I can tell you my own diet has been changing. You know, I, I don't like to eat meat that much anymore, maybe because I'm preaching so much about, about eating a more plant-based diet that my mind is shifting away from that. But, but you need to really limit the, the amount of animal-based food you're eating. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can avoid it, that's complete. But if not, you know, like Rebecca said, maybe once a week, you know, it should be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so very good. Now, just to wrap up things, we're running out of time. Uh, one of the questions that, that, that we got asked from Ms. Uh, Abraham, when should we refer a diabetic patient to nephrology? Um, should we wait for abnormal kidney functions? So, so the question is, when do you refer, when should you see as, and the short answer is, I personally think that if you have the risk factors for kidney disease and diabetes is one of them, the sooner you get them in to the right nephrologist, and the keyword is the right nephrologist, in the sense, the programs like this, which is about, is about preventative, not just therapeutic, is lifestyle changes that you can do to, to prevent. So, so my answer is definitely when you have any evidence of kidney damage, including albuminuria uh, on protein spilling, you should be referred to a nephrologist and they should work, but find the right one, the one that is proactive rather than reactive. Um, uh, when should a plant-based diet be recommended? I think from day one, it should be recommended. Now, the last question that I have is from a question coming from Pakistan, uh, from Mr. Heller. Um, uh, when, what will be the reason of increasing creatinine from 1.4 to 2.3 in just eight months. So let me let me answer this. So uh, the creatinine went up from 1.4 to 2.3 in just eight months. So this is not just chronic kidney disease. This is acute kidney injury on top of chronic kidney disease. So that's number one. Uh, number two is we need to look into all the reasons why this can happen. Is this progression of the kidney disease? Is it dehydration? Do they take medications that might have been harmful? Are they on this red meat and other stuff that is potentially harmful to the kidneys? Do they have any other? Is, is the urine sediment active? They're spilling red blood cells, white blood cells. And if this continues, uh, should we biopsy this patient? So those are all things. So, so when you have, this is an acute component on top of a chronic disease. So, so uh, Mr. Hazard, what I would recommend is to, to do a full workup, including a blood test and a urine test uh, and an imaging study too. Well, what if there's an obstruction to the kidneys that causing that bump? Make sure that the patient is not dehydrated, um, making sure that they're well hydrated. 
and, 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 and ibuprofen and Motrin. Please, uh, um, you know, Christina, if you can put the uh, links to our chronic kidney disease CKD webinars, uh, that would be good. The, the drugs and medications, what you should know webinars, that's also important. And then if you still have questions, please come to our next event and we will answer them. So with that, um, I think I just want to thank um, everybody for attending this event. We want to stay on time. Um, it's it, Six o'clock was always a hard stop. Our next event is going to be the first of next month again. Same time, 5 p.m. 6, 5 p.m. Uh, PST, one hour. If you have any questions, please email them in advance. And eventually we'll be, we'll be answering all those questions. In the next uh, pro program, uh, Rebecca and the team will be going over the role of protein. Also, we'll be bringing in other specialists. We are, we, Dr. Uh, Joanna Shaneman, who's our uh, infectious disease uh, transplant uh, point person. She'll be coming on, I think she'll be coming on September. So if you have any question about COVID vaccine, uh, she will be a very, very good person to ask. Uh, Dr. Ravi Dave, who is the clinical chief of cardiology at UCLA, is also going to be coming into one of our future programs. So this is going to be on a rotation basis, um, and um, we will we will try to address every single question we you have um, over time. So with that, um, I I want to thank all our participants: Rebecca, Mark, um, Jim, and obviously Christina, Anita, our Boon Bean Health, and a circle of core. And we will see you next month. If you please do put comments in our email, what you thought about the program today, what you want to see in the future, how we can improve it. And also like was put in, please follow us on Facebook as well. So with that, um, happy August, and we will see you in September. Bye for now.